So in today's video, I'm going to discuss about how a selection committee looks at a CV. So essentially, I am presuming here that you have applied for a faculty position and then this has gone to the selection committee and the selection committee is perusing these CVs. And the aim of this video is to give you some insight into the selection process and also to help you to develop a better CV if you are a master's or PhD student because some of the facts which I'm going to mention to you are things which you require to know much before the time that you apply for a faculty position. So let's start at the beginning. The first thing the people look at your CVC is your name. And essentially from the name, they locate you in terms of geography, in terms of gender, in terms of your background. And they also try to make a judgment about whether they have seen your name before or whether they have heard your name somewhere or seen you in some conference. Now, name is generally not very important except in the case where you are a particular type of candidate who wants to make sure the selection committee knows about your background. So for example, if you have a Chinese name and you are a female, and your name does not communicate this fact to the selection committee and also maybe you are a US citizen and you have applied to some US university then beneath your name you can put in brackets US citizen comma female so this will certainly help your case if the university is looking to expand its recruitment in terms of the diversity of the candidates it has and which is often the case in technical fields. So again, you want to make maximum use of this particular situation and let the selection committee know about this case. Now, once they have seen your name below it is typically your educational background in terms of PhD, master's and bachelor's degree. And here the committee looks at the university from where you have done your PhD degree and how this university ranks in terms of reputation and how does the department rank in terms of reputation. So this is where they essentially place you in terms of where you are from. Now, once they have figured out your background here, they look at your master's and bachelor's background to see where you are from and whether you have qualifications to teach courses in a certain discipline. So for example, if you are applying to a mechanical engineering department and all your degrees are in mechanical, then that's a very good fit. But if you have done a bachelor's degree in, in production engineering or manufacturing engineering and then PhDs in mechanical, that may be a red flag for some people who want you to teach a large number of courses on the basic mechanical stream. So these are some things the committee looks at at this point. And also if you have mentioned your GPA here, they like to see your GPA and typically for a faculty position, high GPAs are very important. So. If you have got something more than 3.5 out of 4 or maybe 90% in terms of marks, then that is considered to be a good score. Now, why is this ranking important is that, as I have mentioned in some of my previous videos, it actually captures a vast amount of information in terms of your basic education, in terms of your standardized course, your letters of recommendation, your uh, references, the professors you have worked with, the severity and draconianness of your comprehensive examinations and the courses you have taken. So again, most universities try to hire people who have been to top rank universities, especially for the PhD degree. Now, once they have gone through this background in terms of your PhD, masters and BS, then they have a good concept about where you are coming from. And the next section they look at is what are the prizes or any scholarship which you have obtained. And again here, named fellowships would come first. Many scholarships you have obtained, any young scientist prizes, maybe even simple things such as travel grants and so on. Or you have got any best paper prizes from societies such as IEEE, CM, ACM. And these tell the committee that this person is focused toward prizes and getting good name recognition, which generally is a good sign as far as university success is concerned, because generally universities are somewhat archaic structures, which are still focused on name and fame rather than purely on money. Now, the next part of your CV is the journal 
list. And essentially here, they look at the number of journal publications you have, and then the quality of journals, and then further down. So here I would say that the quality of journals is very important. So the people peruse through your list of journals and look at the names of the journals. So again, most people are familiar with the best journals in the field. So maybe you have published in Journal of Fluid Mechanics or Journal of Sound and Vibration or IEEE Transactions. And these are familiar to the particular people and these are considered to be good journals. So again, this is very important. Then they look at the number of publications. So here I would say a number between five and 10 is very good as far as the technical fields are concerned. If the number is too low, then there is a reputation that the person may not be in this publication frame of mind, which is required to get promotion and tenure. If the number is too large, there is some doubt about the quality of the work and maybe the person has interacted with a large number of people and published papers with many people. So this is the next thing people look at is the number of people with whom you have written the papers. And again, if you have written your papers with five, six, seven people, there are some traditionalists who feel that this is not a good way of doing research and working, especially as a PhD student. And you need to make sure that you are in front of this particular list uh, you are one of the people who have contributed a lot and so on. So again, this is just something to keep in mind. I'm not casting judgment on good or bad nature of the work. Some of the work which is done nowadays is very multidisciplinary. So what happens is that maybe one person is working on machine learning, a second person on fluid mechanics, a third person on uncertainty quantification, a fourth person on high performance computing and so on. And together they write a very good paper in a top journal. But what happens is that the people themselves do not know all the aspects of the field. And this is something which needs to be kept in mind that when you are writing a paper, you need to make sure as a PhD student, you know as much of the field as possible. Now, this is one of the reasons why when the number of papers is large, there is a lot of scrutiny on the papers to see if the person has actually performed a small amount of work in a large number of papers and then his publication list has become very large. So this is something to keep in mind. Now, like I mentioned, they also like to see where is your location in terms of the names of the writers of the paper. And if you are a graduate student, it is best to be in front. So you should be the first person in this particular list. Now, once people have figured out some of these things, the next thing they look at is the title of the different papers and from this they can figure out whether you have done work in theory, you have done work in, work in uh, computation or in experiments and then some of the experts in the, second, in the technical or in the selection committee will give their insight in this particular issue as to what is the importance of this particular work. Uh, you also have a situation where people may dig deeper into these papers and they may look at the abstracts of some of these particular papers if they have become useful to these people. So again, this is where they make some judgments about the quality of your work. They also look at the names of your supervisor in terms of PhD as well as postdoc to see if these people are there in this uh, publication list and what is their relationship with respect to you in the particular list here. So again, it is a good idea to publish several papers with your PhD supervisor and to publish several papers with your postdoc supervisor and so on. And again, it is also good to publish papers all the time. That is, uh, you don't want to suddenly publish five papers in a, a particular year. Instead, you want to spread them around your entire PhD program or at least toward the last three, four years of your PhD program. So generally universities like to see that you are not sporadic in terms of publication, but you are a regular type of a person. Now following this journal publication perusal, they come to the conference papers and here again, they see whether the conferences where you have published are internationally recognized conferences such as CRM conferences or IEEE transaction conferences or workshops or symposiums and so on. And mentally they will again grade these particular conference papers and check out their quality and also quantity. Now, just to mention one more fact is that 
through the journal and conference papers, people also look at the page sizes of these papers. So again, that is something to keep in mind. If you have written technical notes, which are two, three pages long, then those are held in uh, a lower degree of esteem compared to very long and verbose journal papers. So now following the conference papers, you may have room for books and book chapters. Now, very few people at the graduate study level write these, but in certain fields such as humanities and social sciences, people do write books as part of their PhD. So that is something which would be considered by the people. So following this, basically the decision is made at this point about whether the person is good or not. And some people do mention certain things they do beside their work. So they may mention that they do music, dance, they take part in martial arts and so on. But again, if you are applying for a technical position or a scientific type of position, these are not really required because if you are applying for a professor position in nonlinear dynamics, then all these things are largely useless and will detract from your main focus and in fact people may consider you are somewhat uh, casual if you write things which are outside your field so if you have things you do such as uh, foreign languages or you are an expert in mathematics or um, maybe you know machine learning tensor flow and so on you can put some of these things so make all these things fit in with the exact program you are applying for so if you are applying for tech disciplines then be very tech in your cv now the question is if all these things are good what happens well i would say that at this point if all the things are good then there is a general consensus among the faculty and then they debate on something known as the fit as to how this person fits with the department and here the fact that you are complementary to the department has a larger in larger impact than if you bring skills which are present in the department so this is something to keep in mind and many situations, a very good candidate may not get selected because the fit is not good and a somewhat less good candidate may get selected because the department really wants the skills of this person and feels that they can use these skills in future. So some of the things which you can do is you can apply to numerous departments so that you increase your chances of getting this fit. You apply globally and also remember that pulchritude is in the eyes of the beholder and therefore do not get disappointed if you get rejection from any department because this is a standard process as far as university recruitment is concerned. And again, it's not personal. It's just a matter of the department considering so many people and then coming to a decision. So these are some of the concepts I had today about recruitment in a department and the, how the selection committee looks at people. And these are some factors to keep in mind. And the fact that you know this now is good for you if you are a master student and a PhD student because you still have time to tailor your CV to focus on writing a few good papers in top journals with less number of people and to prevent yourself from becoming desultory in terms of your research because while multidisciplinary research is very good the problem lies that multidisciplinary research is somewhat not appreciated by the very traditionalist people who are there in any university settings. But they may be very good candidates for research labs as well as corporate research. So that's something to keep in mind. So again, I hope you enjoyed this video and stay tuned to my channel for further videos on such topics. Thank you very much.